Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 825. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's October 10th, 2023. All right, welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. And um, you can tell basically what time of day we were recording by what type of thing I'm drinking. Normally, I sip on coffee if we're recording in the morning. But if I if I have coffee too late in the afternoon, I, I can't sleep at night and I, I get grumpy. So if I switch to my Diet Pepsi, it's generally about two o'clock. I mean, George, it's one forty-three here in the West Coast, West Coast, East Coast. <laughs> We're recording late today. What's going on? Well, Monday being a holiday in the United States, uh, my weekly staff meeting was moved to Tuesday, and we were uh, locked together from 10 o'clock to about, uh, oh, 1.30, 15 minutes ago. Lots to do, lots to discuss. We go over all the administrative things, and then we go through all the pastoral issues that need to be addressed. And I had the first time in a long time that someone's complained about my sermon being political. I talked about having false gods and uh, based on Sunday's Eucharistic readings uh, from Exodus, the Ten Commandments, mm -hmm. and I talked about, uh, you know, education, music, art can be false gods when they become ends in themselves, divorce from God and morality, mm -hmm. and I talked about uh, the pandemic that had almost become a god, where that you know, was an end to itself. And how, and then I mentioned that the government lied to us about COVID on so many points. Oh, that, that's that's political, George. You, you can't do that in the Episcopal Church. Well, I could talk about different sorts of politics, but just, <laughs> but I was floored because uh, uh, I had not thought that through all the way. Because usually I don't do party politics, but mm -hmm. I didn't think uh, that... Uh, Stating the obvious and the facts that uh, uh, well, I there was deliberately misinformation <laughs> from government leaders on COVID was political. But but there you go. So I've had to had to make nice and not backtrack, but try to say, well, remember this is the Episcopal Church. We can agree to disagree and love each other and and not have to be. You don't have to agree with me just because I'm the priest. And so well, one of the problems is. There's no news source people will go to that's, you know, left, right, center. You know, mm -hmm. so the people who were listening to the MSNBCs and the left for the last year and a half, two, three years, the, the have been getting that message, haven't found out that Fossey lied and that Congress has mm -hmm. investigated it. You know, as far as they know, you know, everything they were told two or three years ago is true. And that... Uh, you know, COVID it was something that uh, happened in a bat market or <laughs> a raw food market in China. Uh, whereas people who listen to the other side of the news, I, I don't listen to any news, but I think Fox is still conservative. Um, there's a, a, something daily out there or News Nation or something. Um, those people uh, probably know that it's changed, but they don't know the stuff that's been told on the, uh, the left either. So When COVID was... When we were in the COVID crisis at its height, I had people quit the church because we were still open, because we were irresponsible. And I had people quit the church a month later when we closed, because we had closed the church. And, you know, I, I went through those losses, two or three here, two or three there on either side, nothing much I can do about it. But now to think three years in, we still have people who think that the government... Uh, has been entirely honest and squeaky clean frankly amazes me but you're right kevin if all you know is based on the mainstream media unfortunately you don't know very much no and there's deficits on both sides okay you just because you listen to fox news you doesn't mean you're getting all the news just because you listen to msnbc which my mom faithfully does does not mean she gets all the news uh sometimes in conversations with her i'm like you don't know you haven't heard, but I'm not there to correct her. No, 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 no. So another thing when we record in the afternoon and people are going to notice is George and I are not spontaneity enough as we normally are. 
you sat through a three hour meeting, you're tired. Um, I, I, I had a big lunch, I'm full. So we'll be a little slower. I just, I'm warning the audience up front. And, and also, it's pretty tough topics today. Yes, it pretty is. Tough topics. Oh, absolutely. I, I feel, you know, the, the spiritual repression in talking about these things. Uh, first story, Church of England House of Bishops commends the LLF model to the Synod that comes up in October and recommends that the Synod vote for it. Um, let's give a brief synopsis because about uh, 5% of our audience is brand new. What is the LLF and what does it mean? Well, it originally, well, let's talk about what it became because okay, what it right. became was not what it was <laughs> it was supposed to be. This, this has been the way to introduce same-sex blessings into the Church of England. Uh, that's what it became. Mm -hmm. And the bishops have been pushing blessings to same-sex unions and it wouldn't go through would and it didn't and it would not fly if it went through the normal synodical process because he would need two thirds of vote and you're not going to get that. There's nowhere near getting that. Two thirds and in the synod. In the synod vote, yeah. yes. Uh, but Welby and Cottrell, the archbishops, are quite keen about getting same sex blessings in there, and they put the Bishop of London, Sarah Mullally, in charge of their sort of being their floor whip. And so the bishops have been meet have met and they basically are being encouraged politely or forced impolitely to commend same sex blessings. But as I read the statement, it's confusing because they're commending it, but saying we cannot have we're not ready for independent blessings to same sex unions. So, because that's something that the synod has to come up to, come up with. But synod is not going to come up with it. But we are saying that an individual vicar can come up with uh, a prayer within an existing service if you will have a couple who, during the announcements time at the Eucharist, you want to bless their relationship, you can do that. But then each diocese has to agree to that. So, Kevin, you and I were trying to figure out how, what analogy of were they kicking the can down the road? No, they weren't. They're sort of kicking it up in the air, seeing which way the wind would carry it. So they're in favor of same-sex blessings, but they know they can't get it through legislatively. So they're trying to get it through the back door of giving a local option where the local priest, if he's so inclined, can do it, but then say, but we haven't done anything because we have no prayers to same-sex blessings. It's the Episcopal Church model uh, being redone in the Church of England context. Well, of it's local option, starting with local option without anything on in writing, and then as we saw, see in the Episcopal Church, and then it goes once it's fifty percent plus one, uh, no no dissent, you must do it, and we have the Bishop Love situation arise. But we they also fall back on hey we never changed the doctrine. We haven't changed our prayer book. We haven't changed this, this, and this, and this. We're not outside the bounds of what we can do as bishops here. It, and I think they're also recommending a practice that's happening already anyway. I bet you can go to some Church of England churches and go up uh, during the prayers, uh, you know, uh, the, the end of the Eucharist and have your uh, same-sex relationship blessed. I don't think that would be too difficult in many Church of England churches. The... Uh Andrew Goddard, who uh, writes uh, for Covenant blog and the Sufizo blog, put out a very, he's put out a number of detailed studies of this whole process. And his last paper was very hard hitting because it, it said that here's the evidence that the two archbishops are deliberately undermining the doctrine and discipline of the Church of England. They have decided this is what it's going to be even though they've not offered a theological justification or rationale, and they are basically shoehorning it or elbowing it into place without synodical, uh, synodical consultation, without theological preparation. Uh, I, we talked at the beginning about LLF started out to be something different, mm -hmm. and then it turned into, it turned into, well, this is the vehicle we're going to use to bring in same-sex blessings. That's not how it started out, but it was Welby and Cottrell basically trying to 
introduce a form of papalism into the Anglican world, saying this is what the Archbishop wants, so we have to do it. So that within the House of Bishops, the bishops are so defeated, so broken, so such milk toasts that none is willing publicly to stand up and say to Welby, this will not stand. Now, individuals may tell their friends and put out a oblique statement saying they're not happy, but we don't see any Jack Eichers or, uh, or, or Jack Spongs standing up saying i'm opposed to the process i'm opposed to what the majority is doing i we saw a couple of press releases from the evangelicals but other than that yeah the evangelical great hope of a of a third province or some way that uh, you would not have to have a bad bishop come to your church the bishop said no you don't need that because we're not the problem you're the problem for thinking it's a problem to have gay blessings so we're not going to give up any of our uh, prerequisites or authority. Instead, we're going to uh, make you uh, lump it. Mm -hmm. Now, there's still, it's not over, over, and that there are still ways to make this smart. Parishes can, Church of England, you do not have to, you not, are not mandatory contributions. We have to kick 11% up the ladder to Orlando, and if we don't, then there are consequences to pay. In the Church of England, uh, you don't have to, but the consequences are much less. I know an Oxford parish uh, that has withhold me with withholding money from the Diocese of Oxford because its bishop and its three suffered in its three area bishops are fully paid up members of the gay lobby, and he guy needs an assistant. Well, the bishop uh, Stephen Croft will not license the assistant so long as you don't pay into the. Uh, fold. So they have their ways to get back at you, but most Church of England parishes don't have assistance. And in fact, they have one priest covering multiple parishes, but they can cut off the money. Hmm. One thing we forgot to write down in the show notes, um, and it's big news, Calvin Robinson uh, has been fired from GB. And I thought we could talk about that quickly. Yes, that is the failure of a secular company. GB News wanted to start out to be the Fox News or the Newsmax or the conservative alternative to the lockstep British broadcast media, which is pretty bad. Just imagine your choices are NBC, uh, CNN, NBC, or MSNBC, yeah. or ABC. There's no alternative view. And, and Lawrence Fox, who is an actor, uh, son of Edward Fox from, if you remember the Day of the Jackal, acting oh, wow. family. Okay, okay. He's an actor. He, uh, he's, he's gotten into politics recently as a very conservative leader of the Re Reclaim or the Reform Party. I'm not sure which. Uh, he's run for mayor of London. He's run for parliament. He's a outspoken conservative commentator and critic. He was on a chat show led by a man named da Dan Wooten. And this woman BBC talking head, or ITV talk, woman TV talking head type, uh, was making light of the crisis of male suicide. And uh, Lawrence Fox made an off-color joke saying, I wouldn't want to shag her. I wouldn't want to have sex with her. And Wooten sort of smiled and laughed. They went to the next thing. Well, the feminists and the broadcast authority, the feminists complained to the broadcast authority. The broadcast authority cracked down on GB News and and uh, Lawrence Fox was suspended, and Dan Wooten was suspended for not immediately saying, oh, Lawrence, what a terrible thing to say. Horrible person. And then Calvin Robinson was asked to fill in for Dan Wooten. He said, no, I'm loyal to my colleague. And because of that loyalty, Calvin was fired hmm. by GB News because GB News has basically knuckled under to the uh, liberal establishment. And it's now basically going to be on life support because the people who watched it, the people they watched it for are gone. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if, if you watch The View in the United States, the much, much more here? horrible things, <laughs> you know, you know, I remember somebody showed me, I saw a little clip where Whoopi Goldberg hopes that Clarence Thomas eats a lot of bacon and pork so that he has a heart attack, heart attack and dies. Yeah. 
you know, that that stuff happens all the time. And on the BBC and independent ITV, you hear left wing commentators say that. But Lawrence Fox says something off color. I wouldn't say it. And he gets it, it's the end of the world. Well, but that's crisis on par with the invasion of Israel. They have over in the UK uh, some types of laws that they enforce where you can't offend people. Or if you mm -hmm. are offend offending people, you are investigated. Here in America, we don't have that yet. Both the UK and America have cancel culture, where you can be canceled, lose your job, lose your livelihood uh, if you offend somebody. But that's not uh, something we have in our legal parlance. That's something that just happens well, because of the, the vast woke that's going around. Lauren, Lawrence Fox became a political commentator because he was canceled as an actor. You know, we can, there are a few conservative actors in Hollywood. I can think of Tom Selleck or Charlton Heston, who's dead. Oh, those are the old ones, yeah. <laughs> is um, it Rob Schneider or Schneider, whatever his name is? Yeah. Rob Schneider. Uh, oh, the fellow in The Karate Kid. What's his name? Um, yeah, I don't know his name. Yeah, well, the point being, there are few, only a handful. Yeah. Uh, Steve Casaville from The Last Temptation of Christ, who are outspoken in their conservative uh, viewpoints. Well, they have a hard time getting film jobs. Uh, Lawrence Fox opened his mouth and has been blackballed ever since by the British TV establishment. So he basically was forced into politics because he couldn't work as an actor anymore. Hmm. And it's... Uh, uh, now, I'm not saying that uh, Lawrence Fox said something that was so witty and charming that everybody should laugh. Yeah, it was vulgar. but yeah, It's I, regrettable. I mean... But, it, but I support your ability to say it and your ability to say it on TV. Um, I would not say it. I do find it regrettable that he said it. However, you know... It's it, his it, right to say it, and I support his ability to say something stupid. Yeah. Look, Kevin, we have the right to say something stupid, and we do. Up to a point, YouTube does censor some content. But, yeah, we stay, stay well within the confines of YouTube. But, yeah, I mean, the, the, we live in a different realm than we grew up in in the 80s. Uh, and, I was allowed to offend people, and I did so humorously all the time. And I got my college buddies or my friends, and we were insulting each other all. You know, <laughs> what, what is sarcasm I, for anyway? <laughs> I got involved in a social media spat, which I never ever oh, do. I can't do I that. Never ever do. Michael Corrin, who is a Canadian commentator, he had been an he had been a Roman Catholic, and spokesman for the Catholic Church. Then he became an Anglican. And he's very liberal, and he's a liberal commentator who appears on the CBC and all the time. And he had an op-ed piece in a British newspaper attacking Calvin Robinson after he was fired. And I just posted a little comment saying, this is unkind and ungracious, you know, this is not the way you should do it. And he responded, well, pick out two or three points and that were unkind and gracious. And I said, and I re responded saying, through the first 90% of the article, you play the ball, meaning you you talk about the issues that you disagree with Calvin on, but then you close by attacking the man, saying that broadcasting the church would be much better without Calvin. That's just, you know, where you, I may disagree with Justin Welby on what he says and what he does and so much of his public acts and private actions but if people hear me to say I hate him as a man, then I've made a terrible mm -hmm. mistake because I don't hate him as a man and I don't judge him as a person. I don't have any window into his soul. Things he says, I just like intensely. Uh, but when you when you personalize it, make it ad hominem, and there's a danger for, of that happening. Um, but you know, the left is now out for Calvin Robinson and Lawrence Fox and Dan Wooten and celebrating uh, with joy that they've been taken off the air and celebrating not because their voices are being silenced but because they want to hurt them yeah and that's so unusual that's not that's not good it's not good and it, it does not bode well for a future where uh, we used to have debate we used to be able to you know okay tip O'Neill Ronald Reagan uh, they they were called after 6 p.m. friends during the day, they, they uh, Tip O'Neill, Speaker of the House in the 80s, Ronald Reagan, awesome president from 80 to 88. Okay. But during the day, they fought. 
Is Reagan wanted his way, Tip O'Neill wanted his way. After six, they would go out for dinner, be casual, tell jokes. Uh, Ronald Reagan had many funny jokes about his uh, friend Tip O'Neill from Massachusetts. Um, we don't have that anymore. We have no rapport after six. Uh, we are still enemies after six. And we need to, to quickly change that so we can have honest, uh, heartfelt debate and still care for each other because we care for the country. We've lost that too. George... Next story is the worst story I've reported on since the formation of Anglican TV. Hamas has uh, broken through the borders into Israel and killed, at best reports, 900 civilians. Uh, in that 900 were 260 uh, teenagers, uh, young people who are attending a concert. Uh, they kidnapped uh, many people, taking them back into uh, the Gaza Strip. And this, this is hard to report uh, because this is a conflict that has not been going on for 20 years or 50 or 100. It's been going on for centuries, if not a thousand years. And we're watching, you know, if, if you want to get really down to it, this is the failure of uh, the British politics of, of the 1920s and the 1910s. If you want to get down into this, this is a spiritual battle. If you want to get really down into it, uh, the, the Jewish people are, are the indigenous people of, Is of Israel. Uh, I mean, w w where can we end this without uh, becoming part of the battle? How do we Just approach return, this in peace? Re, return the land to the Hivites, the Jebusites, and the, the other Canaanites, people. Yeah, <laughs> uh, driven out uh, when uh, when uh, Joshua crossed the River Jordan. Mm -hmm. um, I saw uh, more Jews died on Saturday in one day than at any time since uh, I think November right. 1944 in a place called Auschwitz. Mm -hmm. it's the most Jewish deaths in one day since 1944. Um, the responses are horrific. Uh, I mean, it's a terrible. Uh, I we don't. I didn't even know where to begin. Um, the, of course, the ch religious leaders put out statements. Welby and Cottrell put out a statement uh, where basically they pray for peace in the Middle East. And the Israeli embassy to the Vatican said, thank you for that statement. It's really heartfelt. Then the primates, patriarchs and bishops in Jerusalem, the, all the religious leaders in Israel, put out a statement which the Israeli government embassy and the Vatican said, you know, you're promoting an immoral ambiguity where you're basically equating Hamas and Israel as being equally guilty in this. Mm -hmm. And that's just sick. And then we see mainline Epis uh, Episcopal Church. Michael Curry's in the hospital, so he hasn't. He's recovering at home from the hospital. Good, I'm glad he's home. But but one of his aides put out a statement with just anodyne sappiness. You know, like Rodney King in Los Angeles. Can't we all just get along? Uh, but then we have other religious leaders basically saying, "Okay, now that Hamas has finished its attack." Now we should have a ceasefire. There was an article. There's a little story. The Babylon Bee after Pearl Harbor. Hirohito says now's the time for a ceasefire, because uh, they want their free punch, and they don't want to be hit back by Israel. And what we're going to see, of course, is Israel respond in a massive way. Uh, water and power have been shut off to Gaza. They're doing uh, pinpoint strikes on uh, uh, assets. Uh, military assets and then the army is going to ro roll in and I don't know where it's going to end some people say the Egyptians are only going to take so much they don't want two million Gazans pushed into Egypt so they're going to push back Maybe, that's, the, uh, that's the, southern, the southern border of the Gaza Strip is Egypt Yeah. Um, maybe Hezbollah and the northern border of Israel they say this is an opportunity to you know strike south while the Israeli army is occupied Will Jordan break apart? The Iranians? Then we've got, I, in my view, foolish politicians saying we should attack Iran. Now, Iran may be behind all this, but the last thing this country needs is a war. Another war. 
in the Middle East. Another war yeah. in the Middle East. Where, what does winning look like uh, in a war with Iran? Well, um, it, I mean, this will go off as the Hamas Israel war. Uh, it should be called the puppet war. You know, ha Hamas in this case is the, the puppet of uh, Iran. Uh, the uh, Israels uh, are, are puppets of trying to, you know, control it, you, uh, borders and and live in this uh, quagmire they've been given. Uh, they were kicked out by Rome, came back, kicked out again. Uh, these are people who, no matter what country they've gone to and occupied in Europe and elsewhere, have been unwanted. Uh, maybe India liked them, you know, and so. Uh, it, it, it's it's hard to uh, see these people not being victims, and it's hard to see the the people living, the citizens in the Gaza Strip, not being victims. Hamas has ruled over them. Uh, before that, the PLO had ruled over them, uh, and you, you can't make it income loving there. Uh, it's one of the poorest places, uh, very populous, poor places on earth. Um, but yeah, can Kevin and George have a solution? No, we we have no solution for this. This is above our prey gate, but Bill Clinton tried. Bill Clinton met with, uh, who was the uh, Prime Minister of Israel at the time, uh, in Arafat uh, for many Camp David meetings, and he got uh, uh, the Prime Minister of Israel to agree to 95% of the PLO's demands, except the PLO would not drop one thing. They would not drop in their charter the call for the destruction of Israel. So you take that out, they're going to give you 95% of what you want. Just take that out of the charter. Cross it out. You can still call for it verbally later, but take it out of your charter. And Arafat wouldn't do it. And that's some where, politician, you know, Go ahead. Some politicians and commentators are making the point that, uh, argue, they're making the argument that weakness breeds uh, this environment where the Israeli, where the Israelis will be attacked. If these, if the United States is standing back from the world and giving Iran what it wants and sending money to the PLO and dithering in Ukraine and this and that, this is the time when the bad actors act. This is when the time when the little rocket man in North Korea is as obnoxious as possible. Um, well, a weak, go a weak government, a weak military posture invites this sort of thing is the argument. And I tend to agree with that. I do, but if Israel did not exist, if they had not reconstituted as a country, I, and all that was in um, the Middle East were mad Arabs, would we have any care at all? But would America do no. anything? No. Uh, we do have a great love and affection for the state of Israel, and uh, it behooves us to protect them, and we do so by giving them $4 billion a year for their defense. That's a lot of money. Um, well, it, you know, well, we can't change uh, the political makeup of the world, no. but we as Christians certainly can pray and pray, f pray for peace, mourn for those who've died mm -hmm. and pray that uh, for the peace of Jerusalem, that God's will shall be made known to all, all the parties. What that is, I don't know, no. but that's what I pray for. Well, uh, CMJ sent us a statement uh, after uh, things opened up over there um, asking us to pray. And uh, we certainly will. We want to. Uh, as of the sending of this email, they gave us a situation. They said, please pray for all those who have been injured by rocket fire or terrorist gunfire, for all those who have been kidnapped, uh, that the officials in Israel will decide how to respond and will it be graced with the wisdom of the Lord. Uh, and I'm going to put a link to this in our show notes so you can uh, add this to your prayer list as well. Um, I, I don't like war, George. And I, uh, as a, a person who studied much history, I, I don't see a lot of benefit to war. Not a lot of people no, win, win a war. I, I, no, I can understand, and whether I think it's good or not, Israel is going to have to hit back, and it's going to have to hit back hard. Mm -hmm. Um maybe they can find a way to decapitate the leadership without killing tens of thousands of people i don't know i mean i'm not a military man but uh i just 
expect bad things to happen. And it, then, well, at, then at a certain point, we're going to see the chorus rise of the, the left in the United States denouncing Israel for its response. And I almost think this, I mean, if they had gone out of their way to find a way to make Israel look bad, it's just provoke them so badly that they have to hit back. Well, there's a cycle. Okay, the cycle is we send armaments to uh, Israel to protect them. Okay, and they protect their borders. Um, and for 17 years, they've kind of locked down the Gaza Strip. Uh, and the cycle is we send the money, they use that to protect themselves, uh, the armaments to protect themselves. We get mad, we uh, threaten to cut off the money, then we send the money again. It's a, it is a vicious cycle. And what also disturbs me is the responses I've seen in Western cities. Um, oh, New York. In, Angl in, Ang in New York, there were uh, pro-Palestinian types in front of the Israeli consulate. Mm -hmm. um, and what was horrifying in, in Melbourne, Australia, was there was a Palestinian demonstration in front of the Anglican cathedral there and an Anglican priest whose mother happens to be a Holocaust survivor came out and waved in front of the cathedral, waved an Israeli flag for a minute or two, and was set upon by a, a Muslim mob and had to be rescued by the police. He was chased down the street and they wanted to kill him. This is Melbourne, Australia. Yeah. And if you look in London, you look in Montreal, um, the uh, immigrants from the Muslim world who are not wanting to assimilate uh, in the United States, in the West, are uh, rising up in support of Israel. There was, there's one thing in the local news, uh, there was a an Israel demonstration in Hallandale, Florida, which is a heavily Jewish area of Broward County, and yep. some mm -hmm. Muslim activists tried to break it up and they had to be rescued by the police because there are more Jews in Hallandale, uh, young, young Jewish men in Hallandale than there are young Muslim men. But Man, the last thing we need is for them to import their group problems here. There was a stink in England, uh, not on Israel, but in the city of Leicester. Uh, Julian Mann wrote about this for Anglican Inc. There were riots between Hindus and Muslims in Leicester, England. And the Home Secretary, Secretary Suella Braverman said, you know, we have to stop importing the domestic pathologies of India and Pakistan into England where their political problems, they bring with them. We have to stop that. They, if they move here, they should become little Englishmen and women. And the Bishop of Leicester, Martin Snow said, oh no, everything is wonderful in Leicester. And Julian Mann took uh, Bishop Snow to task for basically uh, civic boosterism rather than addressing the reality that Muslims and Hindus want to kill each other in Leicester, England, as if they're back in Delhi or Bombay or Madras. Uh, if yeah. any of you have a solution to the uh, Middle East peace crisis, leave it in the comments. Uh, it shall not involve nuclear strike. That doesn't help anybody. Um, and I, I think George's suggestion that you have to kind of decapitate the head of Hamas here uh, is, has to be done, but it has to be done quickly and with very little civilian deaths. Uh, sadly, the Hamas used civilians as... Uh, shields for their weapons and uh, they booby trap their tunnels and they're just waiting for israel to, to invade by ground uh expecting thousands of casualties can, can i jump to a sort of uh, adjacent story about Hold the on. world's worst uh, timing let, let me let me look at my show notes here uh, you gotta talk about south africa aren't you yeah go for yeah. it <laughs> the worst timing of any church in the world has to be belong to the Provincial Standing Committee of the Anglican Church of Southern Africa, who on Wednesday, before the Saturday invasion, passed a resolution condemning Israel for being an apartheid state. Now, this was a sort of a stupid resolution. There was no factual arguments. They were just, people tell us, and uh, we don't like Jews, and we are, we're not anti-Jewish, we're anti-Zionist, just the usual sort of liberal claptrap that you see from faculty lounges and and the South African church is pretty PC. So they put out this statement on the Wednesday 
saying being anti-Zionist is not the same as anti-Jewish four days before the worst pogrom since Auschwitz. Uh, you just can't match bad timing with that. Because I can't. now... Uh, because now the South Africans look like total fools and idiots and moral cretins. Um, I, I have a picture I'm going to put up here. Uh, people who are just clueless for their cause. Um, I, and I don't know if somebody should tell them or not. Yeah. Well, I, it's, I, it's, like that, it's like that congresswoman, Rashida Tlaib, uh, the, the Muslim woman from Michigan. Outside her office in the hallway, she has a U.S. flag, a gay flag, the, the rainbow flag, and a Palestinian flag. Well, you know, who's going to tell them that the uh, being gay in Palestine is a death sentence? How can you hold these contradictory? How can you be queer for Palestine? If you were queer in Palestine, you'd be thrown off a roof. Uh, there, there, there's a whole a website devoted to testimonies of LGBTQ people on the queer community trying to exist in the Gaza Strip. And they said, we, we will never come out, you, you know, and we, we have to exist in, these, in the shadows. And you exist in the shadows because you don't want to be thrown off the walls, you know. Well, these kids in that photo are, are just foolishly and ill-informed. And whereas the Standing Committee in South Africa, they're just, I think, foolish. I, uh, well, I put Here the, I am. Here I am attacking somebody <laughs> earlier in the show for ad hominem attacks, and now I call you all these people friends for. So there you go. I'm a hypocrite. I admit it. Okay. So I, I I don't live up to my own standards. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah. I I hope people understand this show is uh, th today we're speaking from a solemn place. Uh, we don't like war, and we certainly uh, don't like war uh, in attacks in Israel. Um, you wanted to break up story about middle class versus working class in England. Um, let's talk about that. This is the most, how should I put it? Unnewsworthy, newsworthy story of the century. <laughs> this is a problem that's existed for what, 300 years? Uh, a study by the University of Bournemouth and York St. John College or University in England did a study on behalf of the Church of England that finds that there's a mismatch between the clergy and the people of England, that the working class are not being attracted into the ministry or not being served by the clergy, and that the clergy is sort of a middle class, she, she, you know, it, it's a preserve of people who, who are like, each other. It's like the House of Bishops of the Church of England. They look, they choose people like themselves to perpetuate themselves rather than having people of a working class or a poor background to minister to the great needs of the people in England. And this is like, oh, you think? Oh, this is like news? Oh, this is. This it's is, a non story. I, it's, well, I mean, I've read this in history books. I've read this story in the Victorian era, in the when the idea of the vicar was the resident gentleman in the community who went and did mean good works for the poor. Yeah. Um, it's, this is not news. And when they do have working class clergy, they're treated abysmally. Just think of poor George Carey. He rose to become Archbishop of Canterbury, but the snide comments made in the newspapers about him were about his class background. He, he wasn't one of us. He was a, he was a member of the great unwashed. Um, one of our friends this show, who sadly passed away a year or two ago, Melvin Tinker. Melvin's father was a miner, and he was the mm -hmm. first member of his family to have higher education. And Melvin was remarkably successful in the parish ministry in Hull, uh, because Mar Melvin was the exact sort of person the Church of England, in these reports, says its needs, but will do nothing to encourage to join the church or become ministers. So what does the Church of England have to offer the working class of England? Not much. Well, they, they, don't, they can't offer anybody anything. They don't have a gospel anymore. Uh, we can offer you mediocrity. We can offer you conflict. We can offer you anything except what a church should offer you. In fact, we can offer you gay wedding. We can offer you culture. 
we'll offer you the worst of the culture of uh, the UK. you find it in our churches. It's strange. George, last week we reported on uh, a uh, Q&A that Pope Francis had filled out. And it's been made public. We talked about it. Got a lot of views, lots of comments. Uh, they're supposed to be meeting in Rome. And not Rome. It, the Roman Catholic Church is meeting uh, the heads of state this week. What's going on? Well, there's a synod meeting, a synod mm -hmm. on the family. And there's been a media blackout, uh, okay. or was. I think it may have been lifted, where they're uh, discussing these issues. And w you're referring to a dubia which is a written question post given to the Pope asking for clarification of doctrine. Five cardinals, conservative cardinals, an American, a Mexican, a Ghanaian, a German, and somebody else. I forget who. Another, two Germans, I think, or whatever. Whatever. Gave this dubia to the Pope on gay marriage, or gay blessings, and some other issues. And Francis came back not answering them in the traditional form which is yes or no but rather giving an ambiguous statement and then essentially saying that there are no essentially coming out that there are no moral objections to blessing of same-sex unions it has to be made on a pastoral basis so that has been before the synod and we're not hearing much about it from within the synod but what this means is that the outside critics have basically been able to pick up the football and run with it because what does this mean? Well, let's say uh, they come out with an Anglican type statement of local option. Like let's say they do something like the Church of England. And you, let's say you are a Catholic parish priest, which has a liberal bishop. Let's say you're a German or a Belgian or Dutch or an American. You have a liberal bishop and you're conservative and you refuse to perform a gay blessing for somebody and they can sue you and compel you to have a wedding and because the bishop it's not a matter of catholic doctrine anymore it's a matter of your personal prejudice it's the the what the catholics conservatives are saying is without using these words what happened to bill love is going to happen to every catholic conservative in a liberal diocese if you don't toe the line now that the prohibition absolute prohibition has been lifted and made sort of a personal choice. If you don't agree with the personal choice, you will become the target of the gay lobby. And just as Bill Love was deliberately hounded and targeted and forced out of office in the Episcopal Church, this will happen to faithful Catholics in certain parts of the world where their bishops will not stand up for them. This is going to happen in the Church of England. We've had... Uh, stories of uh, clergy uh you know the chaplain in that english boarding school who refused to abide by the extreme gay agenda and the bishop of derby uh refused to back him up and in fact uh, agreed that he should be investigated as a terror threat because he didn't back the gay agenda there's an article recently about a, a woman teacher who was fired and is going to be banned from ever teaching again because she said that God can love you even if you're not gay, and that being, you know, gay sex is sinful. This is the Church of England schools, and they're firing teachers for teaching the current doctrine of the Church of England. Um, and the leadership is nowhere to be seen. All right, so let's finish up here and talk about the fog of war and the fog of the pandemic. Um, when things are happening, and you go to look for news sources, uh, a lot of things are called first reports. Uh, here with the uh, the attack in Israel, a lot of first reports have uh, occurred, and you kind of need to wait for a day or two, we do, as uh, readers of of the news, to, to find out what's really happening. Don't initially look at first reports and say, ah, that's that. Okay, cool. Uh, don't judge everything. We did that in the pandemic. First reports. Oh, it's from here, and it's going to do this, and 10% uh, of people will die instantly, and that you know that type of thing. There was the fog of the, the pandemic, and sadly, in this day and age, there's no real true journalism. Nobody gives you both sides of every story. Uh, every news source is tainted. We're tainted. I've I've a God bias. I admit it. Um, and you know, just be careful what you believe. Uh, I remember the early days of uh, the invasion of Kuwait 
Uh, it was reported that the Iraqi uh, soldiers had taken babies out of their incubators and left them to die and stole the incubators from a hospital. Mm-hmm. That report in Congress uh, actually led us to go to war with them when that was heard. Um, we found out after the war that that quite wasn't true. So you need to be very careful what you listen to. Um, oh, yeah. So the uh, the lies government officials told mm-hmm. about COVID are now catching up with them. Yeah. And I use the word lie deliberately because in testimony before Congress, it has been demonstrated that Dr. Fauci, Dr. Burks, uh, Dr. Walensky, the Lenska, the head of the CDC, made public statements that they said were of scientific medical fact that they knew not to be true. Uh, you can, and that the uh, Rand Paul, the senator from Kentucky, who's also a physician, by the way, has just released a book where he document where he basically shows the receipts that uh, Fauci financed and knew about the Wuhan laboratory stuff. He sent them the money. He knew what they were doing. He knew it was a lab leak from the very beginning. There's testimony to that effect. And he's referring Fauci to the Department of Justice for criminal prosecution for perjury before Congress. Um, Now, the end result of this is that the medical establishment has been so severe. It's so severe. It used to be, you know, everybody trusted their doctor. Um, You may trust your individual doctor, but do you trust the medical establishment anymore? after what we went through for the past three years. Um, you you know, I see in Sunday school, I, I hate to use a local analogy, but I see the damage done to children who were not in school for two years. The farce of putting a kindergartner on Zoom classes, that's a farce. They're not in school. Um, or first graders, or second or third, elementary school children you know, trying to be educated by teachers over Zoom, they've lost those years. Um, In Sunday school, one of the issues we have is the re-socialization of children who were locked down and locked out and essentially warped by decisions that they knew at the very beginning that children were not susceptible to this. And yet children had to be locked out as if they were elderly people uh, on uh, nebulizers. Just incredible medical hubris and arrogance that has just so damaged this country. Hubris? Did you say hubris? Zoom has recalled its employees. Zoom says work cannot be conducted by Zoom. You need to come. No more remote workers. Ah, So, ah, hubris it was. Yeah. All right, George. We put together a pretty good program with only four stories. You know, and a solemn day. Uh, We offer our prayers uh, on behalf of Anglican TV and our viewers to the State of Israel and its people. Um, We ask that you as our audience continue to pray for the situation. If you have any ideas of how to conduct peace in the Middle East, I'm I'm all ears. Put it in the comments. Um, Because the the political heads uh, for the last... uh, uh, 1,200 years have not done a very good job. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 825 of Anglican Unscripted.